There's lots of great reasons and benefits for being actively engaged with your church family and in-person services, online services. But generally speaking, the number one reason people give for uh, attending a worship service, being a part of a service, whether it's online or in person, is I want to know God better. I want to know who He is. I want to experience more of Him in my life, and I want to experience Him in life every day of the week. You know, every Sunday matters. Every day matters. And I want to know how He relates to my marriage or to how I raise my kids or paying the bills or aging or dealing with sickness. For some, it is I want to know him better because I just have this feeling, this longing that, and he's put it inside each one of us, this, this knowledge that he exists and, and that he's real, but maybe you're not sure about it. Well, this message series is about helping you meet the need you have to connect with your creator, whether you fully believe or you're still trying to figure out, you know, what exactly do I believe uh, about God? Over the past few weeks, I've shared with you about living with God the Son, Jesus, that Jesus is, or He can be, your Savior, your Lord, your God, and how that helps you. If, you, if He is your Savior, Lord, and God, how that helps you, how that benefits your life. And you can catch any of those messages online at hollychurch.org. And today we're moving from demystifying, making clear, God the Son to demystifying God the Father. And I know a question that comes up right about now is, well, how many gods are there? You know, is there one? Is there two? Is there three? Well, what does the Bible say? The answer might surprise some of you. Moses, uh, writing in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16, says, beware lest your hearts be deceived and you turn away and serve other gods and worship them. So Moses says, there's other gods. Well, how many? The Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 8, 5. For though there are so-called gods, both in heaven and earth, many gods and lords, in fact. How many gods are there? Well, the Bible tells us there's a whole bunch of them. There are all sorts of gods and lords and always have been. However, there is only one God and one Lord. That is, only one creator and one Lord over all. The Apostle Paul, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. For though there are so-called gods, both in heaven and earth, many gods and lords... In fact, to us, now the us there is those of us who follow the God of the Bible, who follow Jesus. To us, there is only one God, the Father, from whom everything comes and for who we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus the Christ, by whom everything exists and by whom we ourselves are alive. Now, when we read what we just read there, where Paul writes, there's many gods and many lords that people follow. I totally get that because each one of us, we are created with this need to worship. It's part of our design. We're created to worship our creator. And when we refuse to do that, or when we reject that we even have a creator, then something else is going to fill that void and we're going to worship something or someone else. So I get that. There are many gods out there from money to Allah, from uh, governments, you know, this politician's going to save us from governments to movie stars, from kids. Oh, I got to do everything my, for my kids. Uh, I wor- people worship their kids to sports. I get that part. But what about when it says there is only one God, the Father from whom everything comes? So creator, right? From, from the one from whom everything comes. But then, it doesn't stop there. It says, there's only one Lord, Jesus the Christ, by who everything exists. <laughs> Creator, again, right? By who everything exists. And then, uh, Job chapter 33, verse 4, Elihu says, 
the Spirit of God has made me. So the Holy Spirit, creator again, has made me. So is there one creator God? Is there two creator gods? Or is there three? Now, many places in the Bible, we're told our God is one. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. Now, we hear that word one, and we usually immediately think singular. And so, we apply that singular thought to God. And then we put our brains into overdrive trying to figure out how God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit can be one. And we'll come up with all these different terms that you don't find in the Bible to describe this. And I don't think it's that complicated. You see, one has another meaning. One also means being in unity, unified as one. The team work together as one. Husband and wife become one. The church work together or serve together, work together as one. So God, our Heavenly Father, Yahweh is his name, Jesus, the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit, there's three distinct personalities, but they're one. That is, they work in perfect unity as one. The Father is all God. The Spirit is all God. Jesus is all God. One times one times one equals one. As I mentioned earlier in this series, you see God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, unified, one in their work at the baptism of Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, Jesus, so Jesus, the Son of God, God in human form, uh, God revealed to us in human form, left Galilee and went to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. Jesus lives in the country, be kind of like we think of it, maybe the state of Oregon, like in Galilee, and he's traveling down to Judea. So he's traveling to another uh, state to be baptized in the Jordan River, and he's going to be baptized there by John. Who's John? Well, John is, is his cousin, and John's been called by God to prepare people for Jesus's ministry, for Jesus's work. But John kept objecting and said, I ought to be baptized by you. Why have you come to me? Jesus answered, for now, this is how it should be because we must do all God wants us to do. So Jesus, being our perfect example, he's looking ahead. He's looking ahead to you and to me. And he knows we're going to be commanded to be baptized into him. We're going to be expected to obey him. So by being our perfect, he's being our perfect example by being baptized. Then John agreed. So Jesus, God the Son, was baptized. And as soon as he came out of the water, the sky opened and he saw the Spirit of God, God, the Holy Spirit, coming down on him like a dove. Then a voice from heaven, so God the Father, Yahweh, said, this is my own dear son, and I am pleased with him. We see God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working in complete unity. Now, when we say, you know, husbands and wives are one, a team is one, the church is one, we never (laughs) reach that perfect unity. That's not the case with God. It's perfect. It's complete. They are working as one, and this is what it means. When we are told our God is one. There's three distinct personalities or persons, but they're one. They're working in perfect unity. They are God. A common question that comes up is this. Well, what's going on when Jesus, Jesus is praying? Who is he praying to then? If Jesus is God, who's he praying to? If, when Jesus is on the cross, who is he talking to? Well, I don't think anyone other than God, has the ability to answer that question 
completely. But what the Bible writers reveal to us is this. Jesus is all God when he is praying to the Father, who is also all God when he hears the prayer. It's important for you to know, realize, and understand God can be himself without revealing all of himself. This is why Jesus can be fully human and fully God at the very same time. The Apostle John, he records this conversation between Jesus and another Apostle Philip. John chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do, such as calming a storm like we saw in last week's message that Jesus did. So here, though, you have God the Father, God the Son, two distinct persons, but they're working as one in complete, perfect unity. Now, I want to be totally clear. There are aspects of our God that are difficult to understand, that are difficult to explain. And the Bible is completely upfront about this. Moses writes, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to Yahweh our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So some things we are not going to understand. They are the secret things. They haven't been revealed to us. But here's the awesome thing. All the things that have been revealed to our God about us, it's to help us know him better. It's to help us experience him more and more in our lives. He is an awesome God. Who is God the Father? The Father is eternal. We've all asked this question, our, our kids, you know, your kids, your grandkids, everyone seemingly asks this question, well, where did God come from? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know where he came from. The Bible just says he's always existed. Psalm chapter 90 Verses 1 and 2. Our Lord, in all generations, you have been our home. You have always been God, even before you created the earth and the world. From eternity to eternity, you are God. He is eternal. The Father is holy. Now, what does this mean that God the Father is holy? In fact, Isaiah says he's not just holy, Isaiah says he's holy holy, holy. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. Well, holy means he's not like you and I. We are created in his image, yes, but he doesn't have our weaknesses. He doesn't have our failings. He doesn't have our limited knowledge or limited anything. He ne and he never sins. He is the standard and he always does what is right. He always does what is good according to his standard. So he is eternal. He is holy. The Father is power. Not limited power like you and I have. The Father is all powerful. There are powerful forces of nature. We've seen them at work in our world. They pale in comparison to God's power. There are powerful weapons of war, of destruction uh, men come up with. Those, those pale in comparison to the power of God. There are people that, like, that have power that like to lord it over others, you know, hold others down or treat others poorly. But no one and nothing is all powerful like our God, God the Father. Isaiah describes him this way in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 through 28. Who will you compare me to, or who is my equal, asks the Holy One. Look up at the stars. Who created these? 
He brings out the starry host by number. He calls all of them by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. Jacob, why do you say, and Israel, why do you assert, my way is hidden from Yahweh, and my claim is ignored by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never grows faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He never grows faint or weary. There is no limit to his power. Now, what does this mean for you? Well, on one hand, <laughs> you know, if, if we're not walking right with our Lord, and even if we are, it's a little bit scary. There's this being that's all-powerful. We, we can't do anything in comparison to what he can do. Because uh, our power, you know, it, it's not always easy to understand this concept of all-powerful either because our power, no matter how powerful we might be in this life, we all age and we all die. Um, it also means that we should be very thankful that God's primary character traits are things like he's forgiving, he's compassionate, he's merciful, he's patient. But instead of being a, a scary thing for us, maybe we should be very thankful for God's power. Because when he's our God, it means uh, at a very day-to-day -day level, our Heavenly Father is greater than whatever problem or situation you find yourself in or you come across. He's more powerful than your bills. He's uh, more powerful than cancer. He's more powerful than divorce. He's poor, more powerful than all the wickedness in this world. He's more powerful than that test you have to pass at school. No matter what you're facing, you don't have to give up if he's your God, if he's your father, because he's all powerful. Demystifying God, living with God as my, oh, excuse me, let me just say that again. Demyst What's going on here? Here we go. Third time's the charm. Demystifying my God, living with the Father as my God means my problems can be overcome. Since God is all-powerful, then why do I even have any problems? Our problems aren't generally caused by God. They're not God-caused problems. You see, whether we agree with it or not, or like it or not, God created us all with the ability to choose. And so many times, we, you and I, we don't choose to do the right thing, let alone people who don't, well, they don't even believe in God, and they just do whatever they want. They do what's ever right in their own eyes. And all of this disobedience to the way God set things up, it creates, guess what? It creates problems and uh, damage and hurtfulness and everything else. But here's the great thing, because you have the ability to choose, you can choose to live with God as your father. You can choose to follow the one true God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And they promise that they'll always be with us. They promise every problem we could ever face has been overcome. They promise all things are going to be made right. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27. Look, I am Yahweh, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? God the Father, he cares about the big problems in your life. And he cares about the small problems in your life. He cares about you. And I want you to think of your biggest problem. Something probably immediately jumped into your mind here. You know, the biggest issue, the biggest giant that you're facing in your life, the thing that really bugs you or the thing that overwhelms you or the thing that, you know, scares you. You got that in your mind? Well, Peter tells us, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your worries on him 
because he cares for you. Whatever the biggest giant issue problem you're currently facing, whatever that is, just stop. Let's, let's put this message into practice. Just pause right now here a little bit and ask the Father to help you overcome it, to help you deal with it, to help you handle whatever it is. And you can do that right now. You can just say, Heavenly Father, I humbly come before you. I know you've got this, you know, whatever your this is. I, I know you've got me in all this. And even if you're not quite sure about God, you know, you're not, you're not sure if he's real or not, I, I would still encourage you to go ahead and do this, to just say something along these lines. You know, God, I'm still not sure if you're real or not. But I'm here humbly asking for you to help me in this. Demystifying God, living with the Father as my God means my problems can be overcome. Demystifying God, living with the Father as my God means I can make a difference. I really think this is the greatest aspect of living with God as your Father. Not, not the overcoming your problem part, but this part of it. You see, living with God the Father as my God, it's not just about overcoming my problems. It's not about just overcoming your problems. It's about your life making a difference. In fact, often God uses your biggest problems to make a difference in someone's life to make an impact in someone's life. And here is what far too many people do, including Christians. They have problems, they have these things in their life, and they just complain. Or, or they just become bitter and angry. Or they get sick with worry and fear. Well, if God's your father, instead of complaining, instead of being bitter or being worried, use your problems to help others. See, your life, as messed up with problems as it may be, can help others. Your life, as messed up with problems as it may be, can have eternal impact on others. And maybe God's speaking to you right now, he, and, he, and he's saying to you right now, you need to call or you need to talk to. Maybe God's saying to you right now, uh, he's speaking to you saying, you need to invite or you need to speak to this person about Jesus. Maybe God's speaking to you right now and he's saying, you know, you really do need to serve. You really do need to jump in and be volunteering. Or maybe even God's speaking to you right now and, and saying, I'm calling you to the ministry, full-time or, or part-time. Maybe God's speaking to you right now saying, hey, you need to text <laughs> or you need to email or, or you need to give this a financial gift, or you need to do, uh, forgive this person, whatever it is. You know, I don't know what God's saying to you, but whatever it is, I know your life can make an impact. You can make a difference, but you can't wait for your problems to all be gone before you do that, because they might not ever go away. God will strengthen you uh, through them. He'll strengthen you through your problems. He has all power to do that. Peter again, 2 Peter 5, verses 10 through 11. Now the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will personally restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. Peter's talking about there, hey, in this lifetime, there's going to be some suffering. There's going to be some issues. There's going to be some giants to overcome. God will strengthen you through all those things. And, and he said, keep in mind, this, this lifetime, is, it's just a blimp, a blip, blimp, a blip on the greater picture of eternity. Now, let's read this last part that Peter writes. Let's read this out loud together. You ready? The dominion and glory belongs to him forever and ever. Amen. Do you know what dominion means? Do you know what it is? Dominion means power. God's power is with each of us. 
who calls him Father. Our Father in heaven. Now, I want you to keep your eyes open as, I pray, as we pray. Usually I'll tell you, hey, bow your heads, close your eyes. You can pray these words silently with me as I pray them out loud. Today I want to have you pray out loud with me. So keep your eyes open and let's pray this prayer together. Pray out loud with me. Heavenly Father, I want to know you. I want to experience your power in my life. I need your power to face my problems and overcome them. I need your power to make a difference and to impact others for good. God, thank you for always being with me. Amen.